Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. I want to start this video out discussing the Ryzen 5800X3D, aka Ryzen Vcash, as there has been a number of reports that this processor simply cannot be overclocked. So we're going to be discussing that, plus some other really cool stories in this very video. But first, just a quick word from this video's sponsor. Did you just build a shiny new PC? Then you'll need a genuine copy of Windows 10 so you can personalize the system and of course get rid of that annoying activation watermark. We've partnered with WhoKeys to give you guys great discounts on Windows 10 keys and of course they can be fully upgraded to Windows 11 too. You can get 30% off using the coupon code RGT during checkout. I've purchased several of these keys in the past using a personal non-RGT affiliated account and they've worked flawlessly with quick delivery. If you want to pick up a copy of Windows for as little as $15 or a cheap and legit copy of Office, check the links out in the video description below. So a user on Billy Billy, which is a Chinese website, forum if you will, actually f first posted that they were just not able to overclock the processor. It just wasn't supported. And they also, of course, provided images of the processor in question. And since then, social media has been blowing up regarding... AMD basically not allowing you to overclock. There have been some reports that it's essentially locked in the BIOS, but the actual chip itself does allow it, which in theory would mean that third-party software could enable this functionality. One of my sources actually reached out to me regarding this, and these are the comments that they've told me. Uh, bullet points, the 5800X3D is unlocked at a quote chip level, so this matches what others have been saying. It does require an old BIOS if you want to do it within BIOS. So the newer BIOS actually hides the options for overclocking due to AMD's own demands. Now, overclocking does work regardless of SMU. So tools to do it that way will work. So again, software unlocking, sorry, software overclocking should work just perfectly. It's not wise to overclock unless you have beefy cooling. And a quote, it is extremely firmly dense. Now, from what my understanding is, also speaking to a couple of other people, it's predominantly to do with the cache. Now, it is worth noting that this is really early information and these chips are not exactly abundant in supply. You know, it's not like every reviewer under the sun at this point, at least to my understanding, has access to these. So you should take this with a little grain of salt, but I am hearing that the, the actual cache itself, obviously they just whacked a crap ton, that's a technical term of cache on top of the chip, which is really good in terms of IPC gains, but it does mean that that is a lot of additional heat which is generated, it's really dense. So that seems to be the cause of this, and it is basically gobbling a lot more power, perhaps than what you would initially anticipate. Now, that does leave a couple of questions I'm sure are gonna be asked in the comments, like is this why there is only an eight core variant of this rather than, let's say the 5950, X getting the same treatment. Don't forget the 5900 was the original chip that AMD essentially demoed this on, which obviously is a 12 core processor. And well, where's that? The answer to my understanding is it's a couple of reasons that we're only seeing an eight core variant. The first is that this is already 449 US dollars. There's been several leaks now that this is the price and actually it matches up what I leaked quite a while ago. <laughs> it was going to be basically the same price as the 12900K. Now, 12900K, as you can see here, we're actually starting to test one ourselves, is a really nice chip. And it's obviously led to, well, basically AMD facing a lot of pressure. And they're reducing the price of other chips in their Zen 3 lineup. And we're also seeing reports, of course, that they're launching a plethora of other processors as well, some of which are based upon Zen 2. And video cards did a nice write-up on that. So I'll, of course, leave a link to that in the video description, assuming I remember. So one of the reasons is the pricing. The second, as you probably ascertained by now, is basically the bloody cooling of this thing. Now, I'm sure if you have like a really decent AIO, you're gonna be able to cool it, like let's just face it. But still, it is a reason. But also, to a degree, these processors, <laughs> you get it, degree, temp I'm so sorry. Um, but also, uh, to a degree, it's not actually just that. Um, the actual, caches themselves like the reduction of these things is highly sought after because obviously AMD are using them for other things read servers and clearly the markup on those you know for their for their server chips is, <laughs> is kind of high 
Um, and so I kind of look at the Ryzen as like, this is not an exact way to put it, but someone was kind of explaining it to me like it's like the Radeon 7. It was like a flagship, like just to release a new thing. Lots of, lot, you know, lots of good PR. Um, and it's a cool product and it's a great proof of concept and possibly a hint maybe of things to come, not necessarily within that consumer segment. So that's kind of how you need to look at this. It's, it's a cool product and my biggest complaint of these chips, and it's a pretty obvious one that I'm sure most of you have already thought of yourselves, you know, it's like these processors launch in April and you can just be like, well, you know, Zen 4, depending on who you believe, it's basically going to be like late Q3, Q4. So you could be like, hmm, April, May, June. <laughs> you could just kind of do the maths on it and say, well, you know, six months later, there's a whole, there's a whole thing. And yes, okay, that does mean you wouldn't have to upgrade your uh, current motherboard. So for example, if you have like a B550, and you've been using, say, a 5600X, it's a good way to get additional threads or cores, although obviously it makes things really awkward if you have like a 5900X and you also do gaming. It's like, what do you do then? Um, so yeah, you've got the extra upgradability, if you will. The thing is, Zen 4 is just gonna like spank it. Um, you know, it, it's that simple, really. It's just, it's just gonna spank the 5800X 3D. And obviously, Intel's Raptor Lake is going to do much the same thing. Like, even Intel themselves now have confirmed what I've been leaking for a while. And that's that we're looking, you know, a double-digit performance upgrade. From my understanding, it's around 10 to 12, 13%. Possibly an outlier tasks on uh, one thread performance, single thread performance, excuse me, looking at like 15%. But personally, I always like to slightly underestimate. Hopefully, I'll be wrong on Raptor Lake and it'll be like better. Um, but obviously there's IPC tweaks, small ones that they've, you know, done a s subtle redesign of the chip itself, but not exactly a magical, um, a radical shift in architecture. And then obviously you've got slight clock frequency gains. But yeah, I think that AMD and Intel's next gen chips, whoever you go with, is going to be much faster than the V caches. I, with that said, if you have the cache and you're like one of those people who are just like, this is damn cool, go for it. Like definitely buy the processor because it's going to be cool to mess around with. But if you have a decent system currently, eh. And now I want to discuss with you guys a really interesting announcement of sorts from AMD. And this is actually a games development conference discussion slash talk that AMD will be hosting. Now, GDC is really cool. Obviously, it's where game developers and you know, console manufacturers and so on and so on show off really cool tech. And one of the things that AMD are going to be showing off is basically what appears to be FSR 2, as you can see here. Now, interestingly, this also coincides with a tweet from Grayman, who actually mentions that FSR 2 is going to debut with RDNA 3. And if you've been watching the channel for any length of time, you'll know that multiple times at this point, I have said that I am hearing FSR 2 is real and it is a considerable I want to stress that a considerable improvement over FSR 1. Now, I don't want to get into the whole spatial, temporal, and all of that stuff in this video too much because we've talked about it multiple times before. In fact, I already did like a pretty, uh, pretty big breakdown video of FSR 1. I was actually working in collaboration with AMD, so you can search for it on the channel where I discuss how it works. But basically, FSR 1... Um, is essentially a spatial upscaler. But the LSS and Intel's upcoming XESS, they're not. They are basically using essentially machine learning along with previous frames of animation. Now, what this does is it gives spatial data. In other words, it can use previous frames of animation in a means to reconstruct uh, the future frame. So, for example, frame one could be used to provide data to frame two and frame three and so on and so on. So you've got that spatial history. And that combined with, you know, it's upscaling algorithms and all of this other stuff, you know, all this other crap, technical term again, it could be used to better understand, for example, what is hair, what is, I don't know, an eye, what is a car, and so on and so on. You guys get the point. So with this, I'm hearing that FSR2 
is going to be significantly better in terms of visual coursing. And I've heard from a couple of sources that it does take previous frames of animation as well as motion vectors and stuff into account. And I'm hearing the visual quality, you know, I know I've just said this, but I really want to stress, I'm hearing it much better. The, the, the only thing I'm not certain about is whether it's relegated, quote unquote, to RDNA 3 or later. Um, I've heard conflicting things. So one person basically told me that it's not. It does work on Narve 2, for example. However, FSR 1, long story short, has basically a fallback. So rather than running on like lower precision operations, it can run on like full precision operations, uh, which basically still means it's faster than constructing the frame at like higher 4K, just for example but it's still slower than if you have a GPU which supports lower precision. So I'm hearing that it's possible RDNA 3 has specific instructions for this. And I've also put out a couple of videos recently that the machine learning abilities of RDNA 3 are much better. I don't think it's got a chip that's specific to machine learning on the die. I don't think so. I do believe it's baked into the actual shaders, into the, you know, work group processes, because obviously the compute unit's like gone. Um, but I don't know, like I'm getting a lot of conflicting information, which is normal at this point. What I can tell you, and almost everyone seems to agree, is that FSR2 is a major improvement. And I'm really interested because you might also remember I put out a video discussing DLSS3, and I'm almost positive at this point it's real. Like I've had, I obviously can't say who's told me what for many obvious reasons, but you know, judging who's told me, I have really high confidence that DLSS3 is real because I've not just had one person tell me that either. And again, DLSS3, like image quality is a step up over DLSS2. Shock, horror, right? But the interesting thing is, a couple of folks have told me that the performance of DLSS3 apparently focuses a lot on ray tracing reconstruction. Now, if you've watched my recent PS5 Pro video, uh, you know, if you haven't, you can find it in, linked in the video description. I find that particularly interesting because Sony themselves seem to be doubling down on like reconstruction of ray tracing. I don't know. There's, it's just a lot of interesting stuff happening <laughs> in the industry right now, guys. And I personally think it's cool. Also... I'm going to quickly throw this in as the video is getting kind of long already. And yes, that's what she said. DLSS 3 is not the only thing that we're expecting from NVIDIA this year. The other thing, of course, is RTX 40, aka to its friends and its buddies, Lovelace. And yeah, like, we've discussed the performance targets of Lovelace a plethora of times on the channel. But one of the big things is that I'm hearing that A, supply for Lovelace is going to be really decent compared to what it was like in video of they've put a lot of money into let's say buying capacity and other things like they they need it to be a, a launch because rdna3 is going to be really competitive and obviously both of them are going to be utilizing tsmc's 5nm process which is going to be very interesting to see that we have a node parity basically between the two that should be kind of cool um but predominantly the thing i wanted to talk to you guys about is some comments actually from NVIDIA themselves. A spokesperson from NVIDIA, I'm an idiot and forgot to make a note of her name. I'm really sorry. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't say anything other than just an idiot and, you know, I just don't have the link open right now. So I'm really sorry to the person who said this. But long story short, she's essentially said that, you know, we're not going to be seeing RTX 30 go bye-bye. They're basically going to have... RTX 4, uh, 20, as well, yeah, probably even 20, as well as RTX 30 coexisting with RTX 40. Now, there's a few takeaways here, and I'm going to keep this brief because the video is already getting kind of long. But first of all, this is normal. Like, if you were to look at uh, the GTX series of cards, if you remember like the 16, well, I was going to say, uh, the like 1660 Ti's, for example, they were on sale for a long ass time. In fact, this has just been like normal. Like you have the high end which launches first and then slowly the previous generation is replaced. You know, we saw this with the RTX uh, 20 series, you know, as the RTX 20, 70 and 60 and so on launch, you know, the previous generation Pascal cards slowly become end of line. 
But I also think that the next-gen cards are going to be quite expensive, and I suspect that there's going to be some changes, actually, in how NVIDIA are going to market this. You know, at the end of the day, the bottom line is that there have been rumours, again, Grayman and a couple of others were talking about Navi 33 prices, like, I think it's like 500 bucks for Navi 33, and this is basically matching what I've been saying on the channel multiple times at this point, that, you know, Navi 33, I've been hearing is around $500, but these are really early price points, guys. Like, I want to be really abundantly clear, this can change on a dime, and, um, it's going to depend on a crap ton of market conditions at this point. Like, you know, I don't really want to talk about politics because, well, it's not really the channel for this and also it's kind of freaking depressing. But, you know, prices are just up, you know, going through the stratosphere at the moment anyway. So God knows what even shipping costs, for example, are going to be like in, you know, six months time. However, with that said, I do suspect that because they're going to be in competition with one another quite fiercely, it's going to be a case where they're going to want to keep the prices as competitive as possible. So it's going to be a really interesting one, I suspect. I am super excited to see what the next generation of cards is capable of. Like, both RDNA 3 and Lovelace and Intel as well. You know, um, yeah, I'm wearing the t-shirt. Uh, because, I don't know. I just, I, uh, I'm not wearing it for a specific reason, I promise. I just literally just grabbed it out of my... Um, out of my uh, wardrobe because I'd already worked out and I showered on like, you know what, I need to change. Um, but yeah, I just like, really interested to see what Intel do. Particularly given Intel are gonna be entering the card, uh, sorry, entering the market with what is essentially a card which I feel that is gonna be more appropriate in pricing for most people. You know, the offerings are gonna be in the low to mid range. Well, at least when Lovelace and so on launches. It'll be very interesting to see what Intel's strategy is there as well. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. If you've enjoyed it, you know what to do. Leave a likey on the video and I'll see you soon. Stay safe guys, bye for now.